Thank you, Kent. Good to see you. And uh, I want to thank all those who've uh, worked so hard to put this together, especially Jeff Bradshaw, and uh, appreciate this opportunity. And I look forward to those who are still here listening. You are the truly elect. Um, and today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Enoch and particularly try to explore the relationship between ancient texts and the book of Moses. The person's the persons in these texts are of particular interest because additional accounts about their ancient ministries have been revealed as part of the Restoration, and Latter-day Saints believe many of them continue to minister to mortals in various ways after they were translated uh, from earth to heaven. Because of this, many Latter-day Saints feel a strong kinship with these ancient figures, and Latter-day Saint scripture certainly does not present them as fictional creations. So this paper is to examine one of these figures, Enoch, and the things we learn about him from later texts, both canonical and non-canonical. He becomes the model par excellence for preaching repentance and reforming a community to the point that they were of one heart and one mind with no poor among them, becoming worthy to enter God's presence. Um, none of this additional understanding of Enoch's ministry would be possible without texts that supplement the very brief account found in Genesis. Now, in an attempt to frame some thoughts related to Enoch, we'll proceed by making some general points, or I would say assumptions, that affect our understanding of Enoch and his ministry outside of what we are given in Genesis. Point one, <laughs> the Genesis account of Enoch is not a story detailing his life filled with various events like one would see with other patriarchal figures in Genesis like Abraham, for example. But rather, it's a very brief summary description. The only information really given for him in Genesis is his genealogy and that, quote, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So point two, despite the lack of material about Enoch in Genesis, there are many significant later literary traditions portraying Enoch's life and teachings, including the Enoch narrative in the book of Moses. One could argue that these later Enochic traditions <laughs> or texts explain what it means that Enoch walked with God, or they reveal how God took him. But those are at best very general connections with Genesis' original description. The lack of detail about Enoch in Genesis probably explains why in these later texts he is often linked with two other stories in Genesis, the story of the watchers, these are sons of God and daughters of men, and Noah's preparation for the flood in Genesis 6. Point three, since most of the material in the additional texts about Enoch is not directly dependent on Genesis, except maybe these additional stories related to the watchers and Noah, that many accounts about him raise two possibilities. First, that there were additional oral or written accounts about Enoch not included in Genesis that were passed down through other transmission streams reappearing in later texts. Or second, later writers created additional stories ex nihilo about Enoch to fill in information gaps about him, which is a common tact of uh, pseudepigraphal writings. Now, without urtexts or even extant intermediary texts between, you know, before 300 BC, it is hard to prove the historical reality of additional Enoch uh, stories or texts. But the persistent importance of Enoch in later traditions can support the notion that there were oral or written stories related to Enoch besides those that were, are found in Genesis. These other stories could be related to each other, thus calling for the use of tradition criticism or reception history in ways other than tracing them all to Genesis, seeing connections among them. Point four, the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price is an additional narrative about Enoch, but it follows a unique transmission history. We do not have ancient versions of manuscripts or translations that were passed down through the centuries with which to compare it. Through Joseph Smith's revelatory revision of the Bible, commonly called the Joseph Smith translation, we skip thousands of years to connect directly back to the original figures in Genesis, and in this case, Enoch. While this is a form of reception history, it is a unique one, and one of the, that is dependent on revelation rather than historical manuscripts or a clear line of intertextual development from earlier accounts. <clears throat> 
Point five. In texts between the period between Enoch and Genesis and Joseph Smith, we can look for parallels or connections that are drawn to what we find in the book of Moses, the so-called ancient threads, which are the focus of this conference. While this impulse is understandable and valuable, it is not without its challenges. So point six is an example of one of those challenges. It is easy for those looking for ancient threads to fall victim to cherry picking or proof texting techniques that highlight selected aspects of a text while ignoring others. Patterns of parallels and understanding parallels in their own cultural and linguistic context help strengthen the possible relationships among the text, which is not necessarily barring from one text to another. However, while it may be legitimate to accentuate the parallels, we must not ignore the differences. Similar to how type scenes have been fruitfully presented to see parallels between book biblical stories, their differences can also signal important shifts in how the episode should be interpreted. So what if another Enochic text has one aspect of Enoch's ministry, similar to the account in the Book of Moses, but it has much more that is radically different? Are these additional elements true, but omitted from the Book of Moses account? Or were they simply the creative additions of ancient writers? If they are creative additions, then what does that say about the other material that is being claimed to be true because it has a supposed parallel in the Book of Moses? In light of such challenges, critics of Joseph Smith have raised the question of how these aspects ended up in the Book of Moses and claim that Joseph Smith became familiar with ancient texts or traditions and simply borrowed some parts of them from these other sources. So point seven, scholars have long argued for or against the poss possibility of Joseph Smith having access to additional Enoch material from other sources, specifically first Enoch, that were then incorporated into or at least influenced the Enoch narrative in the book of Moses. Since this paper is not specifically about this topic and others have already addressed various possibilities, we will only briefly review some of the claims. While it is true that stories, traditions, and texts about Enoch were floating around America in the early 1830s in various venues and publications, their influence on Joseph Smith would have been very general or, I would say, unlikely, since he was not an academic spending copious time in archives and libraries weaving together a new narrative from indirect references and quotations, many of which were in foreign languages. So in summary, here are some key aspects to this point. First, the Enoch narrative in the Book of Moses has a significant Christ-centered focus, similar to the JST in general and, and to the Book of Mormon, which is not what one finds in these other sources. Second, most of the additional material about Enoch that was around in the early 1800s connected Enoch with the story of the Watchers and the origin of evil that eventually led to the flood. The Book of Moses does not highlight the story of the Watchers like these other Enoch traditions. Its account of the origin of evil is Satan's premortal rebellion leading to the fall, Cain's murder of Abel, secret combinations, and later covenant keepers abandoning their covenants. It's not lustful angels leaving the angelic realm to mingle with mortals. And third, the early saints were ecstatic when they came across an English translation by Richard Lawrence of First Enoch in England in the 1840s because they thought it had rel relevance to their account of Enoch in the Book of Moses specifically and to the Restoration generally. Lawrence's English translation was first published in 1821 with a later reprinting in 1838. Their excitement at having found a lost Enoch text and their likening material from such a text to the unfolding restoration lends support to the idea that it was new to them. For this and other reasons, it is highly unlikely that Joseph Smith was aware of Lawrence's translation of First Enoch when he translated Moses 6 to 7 in late 1830, early 1831. Point eight, in comparing ancient texts with the book of Moses, it is important to focus on the historical context of the ancient texts and their relation to other Enochic texts. When carried out as carefully and as completely as possible, then one can make plausible arguments for the existence of additional oral or written traditions about Enoch that were not recorded in Genesis but passed down in other ways and that could have made their way into the book of Moses through prophetic revelation. 
if facets of a tradition are found in multiple texts that dem demonstrably could be dependent on each other, it increases the likelihood that they go back to an earlier original source. Thus, while it is interesting to compare parallel stories and traditions between the Book of Moses and earlier Enochic texts, we need to be cautious about our claims in light of the fact that evidence of historical transmission between the ancient texts and the Book of Moses is lacking. Now, in the remainder of this paper, I will summarize some of Enoch's influence on Jews and Christians of the Second Temple period, and then uh, also on Latter-day Saints. I will also explore what might be learned from these additional accounts of Enoch. Now, based on brief discussions of Enoch accounts outside the Bible, I will propose possible parallels among them that provide support for the idea of ancient threads in the Book of Moses. Now, after the cursory description of Enoch in Genesis 5, interesting enough, he is not mentioned again in the Old Testament. Considering the significant role he plays in later Second Temple Jewish literature, this absence is surprising. Why does he make his appearance only then, and why in these particular texts? Could oral and or written traditions have been preserved by Second Temple Jewish groups outside of the Bible, keeping his memory and importance alive during the intervening centuries? I'll address some of these questions below, but we can conclude that the figure of Enoch certainly still remains significant among early Jews, despite the brief mention in Genesis and lack of mention in other parts of the Old Testament. Enoch's earliest appearance among ancient manuscripts is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Among the scrolls, the most important and well-known Enoch text is what came to be known as First Enoch. First Enoch seems to be a composite text of at least five originally independent texts, that are usually broken down as follows, the Book of Watchers, the Book of Par Parables or Similitudes, the Astronomical Book or the Book of the Luminaries, the Book of Dreams, and the Epistle of Enoch. The earliest sections were written in the 3rd century BC, the last ones before or during the 1st century AD. The order of the sections did not follow a chronological scheme. The dating of these sections of First Enoch is notoriously difficult because of their varied theologies and languages. But their discovery at Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls give the, gives the latest possible date before 70 AD. But when is their earliest possible date? Too often scholars date non-biblical Qumran texts to their earliest date of composition based on the manuscripts they've found, yet they do not treat biblical texts the same way. They assume that they came from much earlier. While we have found brief biblical passages that predate Qumran, and the Septuagint emerged from manuscripts of the same period, Margaret Barker makes an interesting argument when she says, Our earliest physical proofs for the existence of the Old Testament, pieces of ancient scroll we can see and handle, are also among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Does this mean that the Old Testament books were all composed in the 2nd century BC in the Qumran monastery? It is unlikely. We must not have one set of rules for the biblical text and another for the non-biblical. The Enoch writings could be as old as anything in the Old Testament. We must keep an open mind. When the fragments of First Enoch were found at Qumran, they had already had one lifetime. The texts had been used and copied by the community, but we do not know where they came from or why the community considered them so important that they had several copies. We have to start with open minds and ask when First Enoch might have been written, where the ideas originated, and who cherished them sufficiently to preserve and transmit them. We have to ask how these texts relate to the Old Testament, and not assume that they are a later, inferior work dependent on the Old Testament. One prominent Enoch scholar, Lauren Stuckenbrook, has argued there is no reason to assume that any of the extant materials uh, to First Enoch, including the fragments recovered from the Qumran caves, preserves for us anything approaching an original. So this conclusion implies the presence of various independent texts, not suddenly created at this later time, but rather compiled together from earlier material. This situation increases the possibility that there were additional traditions about Enoch outside the canonical transmission stream that could have had more ancient roots. The Dead Sea Scrolls include not only fragments of texts like First Enoch, but include additional Old Testament retellings that expand on Enoch and other Old Testament figures. 
The book of Jubilees, for example, discusses Enoch's visions of the future, including the final judgment day. It also talks about his knowledge of the heavens gained from an extended period with the angels of God and his exalted role as heavenly scribe and priest, writing many books and mediating for the people. Book of Giants was another Dead Sea Scroll text that shared significant stories about Enoch, including some passages that resonate with the Book of Moses. As the title suggests, the text revolves around the story of the Watchers at the beginning of Genesis 6 and the subsequent offspring who were giants. Enoch serves in his familiar mediatorial role as he interprets the giant's ominous dreams and tries to intercede with God on the giant's behalf. As the great scribe, Enoch returns with a tablet that foretells harsh judgment, but still holding out an invitation for repentance. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs includes the last counsel and teachings of Jacob's sons to their descendants. Seven of these Twelve Testaments refer to a book or books of Enoch. Most of the references are warnings about the sins of the people that are leading people astray, but had been foretold in the writings of Enoch. Throughout these texts, it is righteous Enoch who has written the warnings and prophesies about uh, their descendants. The Septuagint Greek translation of Genesis 5 about Enoch varies somewhat from the Hebrew Bible. First, Enoch becomes the father of Methuselah at age 165, not 65. Second, rather than subsequently walking with God for 300 years, Enoch was well-pleasing to God for 200 years. Now, in both cases, his total time on earth was 365 years. Third, in the Hebrew tradition, it repeats that Enoch walked with God, then he was no more, for God took him. In the Greek, it repeats that he was well-pleasing to God, and then he was not found, because God transferred him. Is the difference in years indicative of different tra traditions about Enoch? Is the phrase well-pleasing to God likewise such a signal, or is it simply an explanation for Enoch walking with God? While these are not drastic differences, they do show that the account about Enoch was not static at the time of the Septuagint. Enoch does appear in a few passages of the New Testament. He is included in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, listed as the seventh patriarch after Adam and the son of Jared and the father of Methuselah, just as Genesis states. Hebrews 11.5 is the key passage for understanding more about Enoch's departure from the earth. The verse specifically says that because of Enoch's faith, he was translated that he should not see death. The Greek term metatithame is the same used in the Septuagint to describe what God did to Enoch in Genesis 5.24. The phrase that he should not see death is not present in the Septuagint. It's present here makes explicit the fact that God's taking of Enoch meant that he left earth without death. The verse continues to explain that Enoch was no longer found on the earth because God had translated him, and God had translated him to show him that he pleased God. So the author of Hebrews, therefore, is drawing upon the Septuagint description rather than the Hebrew. One other passage of New Testament scripture, Jude 1, 14 to 15, not only references Enoch but quotes from him. It again acknowledges that Enoch is the seventh descendant, and then it quotes from his prophecy. And the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints and execute judgment and so forth. Jude's quotation of the prophecy of Enoch found in 1 Enoch 1.9 is significant because the author of Jude seems to treat this passage as scripture even though it is not included in the later canon. This quotation became a source of consternation for some early Christian writers who debated whether its presence here supports or repudiates Jude's canonical status. By way of contrast, Joseph Smith quoted this passage from Jude, approving Jude's reliance on the writings of Enoch. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Second Enoch is another Enochic text compiled in the Pseudepigrapha, although it's not directly related to First Enoch, and its major theme is the ascent of Enoch through the heavens as he is initiated into heavenly mysteries. Um, and this is important in the development of Enoch where in some later Jewish texts, Enoch becomes a more and more glorified heavenly figure, and we start seeing it in this text. Now, the Testament of Abraham is another Second Temple Jewish text that mentions Enoch and his heavenly role. And specifically in one version, Recension B, it identifies Enoch by name as one of the figures at the heavenly judgment setting. 
And in this judgment setting, he is the scribe. He's the scribe of righteousness and the teacher of heaven and earth. And so he records the sins and righteousness of each soul, but he also reads from the book of heavenly records when requested by the judge who is able. So when reviewing the second temple text, we can learn how later Jews and Christians viewed Enoch and his roles. Enoch becomes primarily known as a scribe, often in judgment settings, a teacher of wisdom, a mediator between mortals and heaven, and later an elevated celestial figure. Enoch received many sweeping visions of God's creations and the unfolding of his salvation history among his children. Thus, his importance and status was greatly expanded from the Genesis account although the origins for these expansions are usually unknown. These depictions are primarily later Jewish and Christian interpretations of Enoch, so they highlight the significant roles Enoch played in their religious thought. Now, when we compare this material discussed from the Second Temple period with the Book of Moses, some significant similarities and differences are apparent. And I'm not going to, you know, summarize the whole Enoch narrative in the Book of Moses. That would take too long. But we've gone from four verses in Genesis to around 110 verses, or 4,500 words long. And while this, on one hand, explains how Enoch walked with God, um, it gives so much more detail about his ministry among his people and the knowledge that he gained. Now, since Joseph Smith didn't ever address exactly how or why he made this Genesis, uh, these expansions to the Genesis account, as others have mentioned in this conference, it's an open question whether he felt he was restoring ancient material, making inspired commentary, a combination of these things, or something else. What seems clear is that it was a revelatory experience for Joseph Smith, and the book of Moses is presented as if he were experiencing the similar vision or experience that Moses or Enoch had. Um, <clears throat> now, other Latter-day Saints have written about specific parallels they see between parabiblical Enochic literature in the book of Moses, but today I'm just going to primarily stick with some generalities. So some themes common to the book of Moses in an ancient Enoch literature. First, the wicked condition of the people to whom Enoch will try to preach repentance. While Enoch's mediatorial role is more pronounced in general Enochic literature, there is a sense in the book of Moses that Enoch prays for and mediates for the people. The major difference may be that in other Enochic literature, it focuses on Enoch's heavenly ministry as mediator, while the book of Moses emphasizes Enoch's active earthly ministry, preparing them for translation alongside himself. Enoch receives a prophetic call from God. While in Enochic literature, this is usually part of a heavenly journey, the book of Moses grounds it more on the earthly sphere with the Spirit of God and a voice from heaven commanding him to prophesy and call the wicked to repentance. Enoch reluctantly accepts his call, which is actually follows a typical Hebrew prophetic call pattern. Enoch is considered a lad in both uh, traditions. Enoch is a man of visions. Uh, the Book of Moses calls him seer, and we get many visions, but again, in the Book of Moses, it's from earth, on the mountains, um, rather than up in the heavens. Both narrative traditions mention giants, now, in the Enochic sources, they usually connect these giants with the offspring of the watchers and mortals, as mentioned before, while the Book of Moses equates them with the enemies of God, who are separated from the people of God. Enoch weeps for God's wayward children, but the Book of Moses uniquely calls additional attention to God's weeping as a manifestation of his deep love. Enoch sees the deliverance of some of God's children through Noah and the ark. So he sees his prophecy of what's coming soon after him. And some Enochic texts present the figure of Mother Earth, who plays a significant part in Enoch's vision in the second half of Moses 7. She's usually crying out for the wickedness upon her. The book of Moses is more explicit about when she will finally rest. It's after the redemption is completed by the Son of Man. But there are also themes found in the Book of Moses that do not appear in ancient literature, or at least are not as clear as parallels. For example, the Book of Moses focuses on Enoch's reluctance to accept his prophetic calling because he's slow of speech. The later narrative will show how God turns this around to make Enoch powerful in speech. Besides teaching about God and the creation, found in other sources as well, in the Book of Moses, Enoch teaches more about the fall, its effects, 
how to overcome those effects through coming unto Jesus Christ. This Christ-centered doctrine includes discussions on the plan of salvation, being cleansed by the blood of Christ, and we see also the use of important titles for deity, man of holiness for God the Father, and son of man for Jesus Christ. The title son of man is not only ubiquitous in the Gospels, but in many Enochic texts as well. Here and in the Gospels, it is clearly identified with Jesus Christ, but often in the Enochic texts, it refers to Enoch himself. The book of Moses uses the title Sons of God for those who believed Adam's teachings and followed them. This allusion to the sons of God may be significant for the book of Moses' interpretation of the watchers, a term not used in the book of Moses. As the sons of God were not angels or other types of supernatural figures, but rather those who had believed God's teachings through Adam. Therefore, the sons, of uh, sons and daughters of men were those who rejected these teachings and who eventually lured away the sons and daughters of God from their covenant relationship with God. In the book of Moses, the people of God experience great things as the Lord dwells with them and the glory of the Lord falls upon them. They are called Zion because they were of one heart, one mind, and dwelt in righteousness with no poor among them. And then Enoch is told that they will be taken up into heaven. And this re uh, relocation will separate them from the wicked on earth under Satan's power. This notion of an entire community be take, being taken to heaven along with Enoch is absent from other Enochic traditions where the emphasis is on Enoch as an individual. Enoch's preaching is responsible for this glorious outcome, but he's not granted a special heavenly status like Second Enoch, Third Enoch, and Rabbinic material display where it increasingly gra grants Enoch heavenly powers and status, even to the point of being the archangel Metatron, and even the title given Lesser Yahweh. Um, Enoch sees the coming of the Son of Man to fulfill the planned redemption from sin and death through his atoning sacrifice. A covenant made with Enoch um, affects and protects Noah's family and descendants. This covenant not only applies to the flood, but to the last days as well. There, in the book of Moses, it talks about the future existence of a new Jerusalem that will unite with the city of Enoch. And then lastly, Enoch saw in vision Jesus' second coming and the millennium. So the Enoch narrative from the book of Moses has greatly influenced Latter-day Saints. While it was especially prominent in early church history, eventually being canonized in the Pearl of Great Price, its doctrinal teachings continue to inform Latter-day Saint understanding of Christ's redemption and spiritual rebirth. Now, speaking in general terms, we can categorize four different stages of influence on the Enoch narrative on Latter-day Saints. The first stage is in the early 1830s with the first published material in the church periodical, The Evening and Morning Star, which was an excerpt from the book of Genesis in the JST. As discussed above, it seems that the Enoch traditions in the first stage were not directly transmitted or influenced by earlier Enochic manuscripts. The doctrinal emphasis of the first stage drew upon Enoch's ministry that helped form a Zion community that was eventually translated. The early saints patterned their efforts after Enoch's to gather into one community to create their own Zion of one heart and one mind, with the belief that complete righteousness was achievable on earth. For these first-generation Latter-day Saints, the building of this Zion patterned after Enoch was probably the way the tradition of Enoch most impacted them. The second stage of Latter-day Saint involvement was not until around a decade after the Book of Mormon was first printed, when we see the first definitive mention of First Enoch that's published in Latter-day Saint periodicals. Early members had always shown excitement for lost books of the Bible, so it is no surprise to see their eagerness for the Book of Enoch, which had been recently, quote, been discovered, translated from the Ethiopic, and published in England. It was the missionaries in England that first uh, came across it. The early saints saw parallels between the struggles against persecution recounted in First Enoch and their own experiences, particularly in regards to the government not aiding the prevention of persecuting, sometimes even participating in it. They also saw fulfillment in some of the passages that talked about the coming forth of books or scriptures, and so they saw the Book of Mormon as, as a fulfillment of that. And they even encouraged uh, members of the church to read it for themselves to see whether this ancient text foresaw the events unfolding in the latter days after the Restoration. 
So in the second stage, direct contact with First Enoch became a centerpiece of Enoch discussions. Um, while the efforts to create Zion continued from the first stage, this new emphasis on reading First Enoch and seeing how the prophecies are fulfilled in their days defines the second stage. And it's interesting because this previously unknown text was almost treated as scripture, though never canonized and really probably likely never read by most members of the church um, besides these little excerpts in the church periodicals. But somehow these prophecies of First Enoch bolstered their faith that the many new things being unfolded under the prophetic leadership of Joseph Smith were foreseen and thus true. Now the third stage of Latter-day Saint use of Enoch narrative was in general conference addresses in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries, where they randomly mentioned Enoch in these talks, reiterating earlier teachings from the Pearl of Great Price related to building up Zion, Christology, and gospel teachings in the uh, pre-flood period, and also seeking righteousness to unite with Enoch City. In this stage, however, we begin to see a shift that became even stronger in the 20th century from emphasizing the patterning of cities after the city of Enoch to the theology or doctrines of Moses 6 to 7. Modern Latter-day Saints are much more likely to focus on the doctrines and teachings of the Enoch stories to increase understanding and righteousness. We saw an example of that from the Hafens on Friday evening uh, with their presentation on what we can learn about the temple and other things from the doctrine of the book of Moses. There still exists the notion of preparing for a gathering with the translated city of Enoch, including the future building of a new Jerusalem, but it is more through the righteousness of church members creating a Zion-like community rather than city development. Then lastly, there's a fourth stage of interest in Enoch material by Latter-day Saints, and this is after the proliferation and collection of non-canonical texts associated with the Old Testament, what we often call the pseudepigrapha, and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some Latter-day Saint scholars, most notably Hugh Nibley, combed these texts for parallels to Joseph Smith's earlier revelations about Enoch and other figures. This apologetic effort claimed that most of these Second Temple Jewish texts were unknown by Joseph Smith, and yet aspects of them corroborated what was found in his works. Dealing specifically with First Enoch, Jed Woodworth categorized two opposing views on Joseph Smith's acquaintance with Lawrence's translation of First Enoch. The parallelist position argues that Joseph Smith did not know Lawrence's Enoch text, but included remarkable parallels with that, and so they felt that they could find correspondences between ancient texts, most of which were not available to Joseph Smith, and the purported visions and writings of these figures through Joseph Smith's works, and this would therefore vindicate Smith's prophetic role. The derivatist position argues that Joseph Smith knew Lawrence's first Enoch, English translation, and was influenced by it in his writings. Since this is highly unlikely, as I discussed above, some more recent works have taken a different angle and minimized the necessity of Joseph Smith knowing Lawrence's first Enoch, but instead they look to Masonic traditions or excerpts in English literature for possible influences on Joseph Smith's Enoch narrative in the Book of Moses. Thus, at this stage, which one could argue is ongoing, it is marked by the effort to identify parallels with ancient Enochic material to support or debunk Latter-day Saint truth claims. The focus, therefore, is less on the figure of Enoch and more on Joseph Smith. Now, in conclusion, despite <clears throat> Enoch's brief description in the book of Genesis, he's taken on many roles and greatly influenced aspects of later Jewish and Christian tradition. There's so many manuscripts and traditions related to Enoch that arose in the Second Temple period some of which likely had earlier roots. There are both notable parallels and significant differences between these ancient texts and the Enoch narrative in the Book of Moses. Some of the crucial differences include the Book of Moses' emphasis on the entire community becoming righteous and being translated and not just the individual Enoch. In other Enochic literature, there's the elevation of Enoch's heavenly status to loftier and loftier titles until he becomes the Archangel Metatron and the Lesser Yahweh. And Enoch was used particularly by the Qumran community as a figure to support calendric concerns, which is not a concern at all in the Book of Moses. Christology is a central emphasis of the Book of Moses account, which at most is suggest suggested by some type of messianic figure in general in Enochic literature. Now, some of the similarities between the Enoch narrative in the Book of Moses and general Enochic literature may point to early ancient traditions or threads that were not included in the canonical record. These include Enoch's role as a mediator between usually very wicked mortals and God. 
and he became known as a scribe with his records or books being mentioned in various sources. He is a visionary and seer who received many visions related to God's plan for his children from the creation to the end of time, including the final judgment. As such, Enoch became a great teacher of wisdom from the spiritual encounters and visions he experienced. Finally, he's known as one who boldly preached repentance to the wicked, which resulted in incredible community transformation in the book of Moses. While we cannot definitively state that these parallel traditions somehow go back to the same original or early source, their presence in many different sources make it possible that they were drawing upon a wider body of oral or written Enochic traditions than what is found in Genesis or could have been known to Joseph Smith. These traditions beyond uh, Genesis give us insight into why God would take Enoch from the earth as a prelude to great future events. Just a closing thought for me today is there's still relevance about these Enoch traditions. I think Enoch's story is still important as I feel that Enoch's influence <clears throat> on how to create a Zion-like society of one heart, one mind with no poor, that this should still be relevant for God's children today. Thank you. Jared, um, it seems to me that we have three options for the Enoch material in the book of Moses. Option number one is that it's a revelation from God. Option number two is that Joseph just made it all up. Option number three is that Joseph Smith um, got the material from reading sources that were available to him. Uh, can you think of any other options besides those? Um, maybe a modification of the first one, when you say revelation from God, is this new revelation, or is he receiving revelation of material that may have been preserved in other oral or written traditions? And, and that's maybe another question of that aspect of revelation. Okay, so fair enough. So I'm going to... I'm going to take some of your time here and make a speech. Um, it seems to me that uh, I, I obviously favor option number one. The problem with option number two, that Joseph Smith made it up, is that there is way too much really cool stuff in it that nobody could make up. And... The trouble with option number three for me is if Joseph Smith had first Enoch and second Enoch and who knows what else in front of him, would he have come up with, and, and so if he had those texts in front of him and decided to create a new scriptural text as a fraud or something, would he have come up with the Enoch material that we have in the book of Moses. That to me is the, the most outlandish possible proposal because even though we can see ancient threads, um, why would Joseph Smith, out of all of that stuff that you outlined for us in, in First Enoch, why would he have come up with this wonderful Christian text that emphasizes the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, that emphasizes human agency, pre-existence, priesthood ordinances, and things like that. Makes no sense to me at all. Do you disagree, Jared? I, I am on board with what you're saying here. I, I okay. totally agree because, because he's not drawing really upon these texts as, and, and, you know, like you said, the theology is completely different. Okay. Can you just review for us what texts existed in his time and what the what realistically available to Joseph Smith in a small town? I th yeah, I, I would say probably Josephus would be one that uh, he could use. Uh, may, maybe Philo. Uh, there's this question about First Enoch, but it doesn't seem like 
that's a real possibility. And and even if it were, what is he drawing from it that you can really see in the text uh, that we have? And so I think it's just a, some very general overviews because a lot of these either hadn't been translated in English yet or weren't found until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s. And again, none of that material would translate into uh, what we have in the Book of Moses. So tell us, uh, Jared, while you were working on this, what what things uh, surprised you? Did you have any surprises? You've been working with these uh, non-canonical texts for many, many years. Did anything surprise you? Um, I think one thing that kind of maybe because growing up in the church I've just always assumed that the city of Enoch was just this common thing that everybody knew about uh, in Jewish or Christian world um, but I attended a conference where I was presenting some things about Latter-day Saint views of Enoch to a completely non-Latter-day Saint group and that's what really what stood out to me was how much we have that's unique in the sense of the city of Enoch and this whole community being translated, whereas in all these other texts, it's just a focus on individual. Um, I think Ben Sear mentions uh, Enoch preaching repentance, but it doesn't really uh, discuss the um, results of that with the city. Um, and then to see how much that impacted uh, the early saints and gathering to Zion um, they were trying to model what Enoch was doing. And so this, this text became so important to early converts leaving their countries and gathering to, you know, Kirtland or Nauvoo or, or whatever. Um, a lot of that was because of Enoch and this story. And that just kind of, I guess I hadn't appreciated that enough uh, before really diving into this material a little deeper. Robert Matthews pointed out many years ago that the revelations that came to Joseph Smith that we have in the Doctrine and Covenants that have to do with the uh, creation of Zion started to come immediately after the Enoch story was revealed. And it seems that what the Lord was doing was giving us the, uh, not just a prototype, but a model of people who had already done it before he gives the story to us as a model and then starts to give us instructions to bring it to pass in our own time. Maybe just one other thing that kind of stood out to me from this conference with non-Latter-day Saints about Enoch was they started reading some of these early accounts in the 1840s when they came across First Enoch. And they were blown away by how excited they were about this. And I had never really caught that either, that you know, the excitement of finding first Enoch and thinking, does this have any connection with our Enoch story and the Pearl of Great Price? Um, that bubbled up in, in their comments. They just could see that in their writings about it. Uh, Jared, because you're the last uh, speaker in the conference, I'm going to ask you kind of a summary question. You mentioned um, in your paper that it's easy for those looking for ancient threads to fall victim to cherry-picking or proof texting techniques that highlighted selected aspects of text while ignoring others. Now, we've just uh, been in this conference today and yesterday where several responsible speakers have examined ancient threads and have proposed possible parallels. What are the methodological safeguards to make sure that we do this right and avoid going too far? Um, I think the probably one of the most important things would be to have a similar context, whether that's chronological or geographical. Um, it can be really problematic if we're pulling from texts of a wide geographic area from a wide chronological period and saying, oh, well, these are all connected, when in historical reality, there's really no dependence or connection among them. Uh, and so I think trying to, you know, 
there's enough text, for example, about Enoch from the Second Temple period that you could just look at that and see, are there dependencies among these texts? And then you could then apply that to the Book of Moses and say, does this seem to share some of those same things with the same reasons being used? Or actually, I think sometimes when they use the same traditions but for different reasons, it actually, I think, strengthens the idea that the tradition predates it, but a later writer decides, well, for example, Abraham knowing astrology, there's some Second Temple texts that uh, think that's a good thing and others that think that was a bad thing. But it seems to strengthen the notion that Abraham did learn astrology and taught it to others uh, because we see it in all these different texts, but they're using it for different uh, purposes or have different reactions to it. Do we ever go too far collectively? <laughs> I think uh, often we do, probably. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, we could talk about them as interesting parallels and just leave it at that, but then to say that they're somehow uh, drawing on one another, that's a whole different step. And maybe sometimes we, we take that second step a little bit too, too early. Uh, I've, I've been impressed with our presenters who have done this. Uh, Jared, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. And all your work on Book of Moses. You've done a lot with the manuscripts and so forth. Thank you. We would like to thank sincerely all who have participated in the conference, Tracing Ancient Threads in the Book of Moses. Uh, this has been a feast of good ideas, in my opinion. Thank you to Elder and Sister Hafen and to the other presenters. Thank you to the conference organizers. Thank you especially to Jeff Bradshaw, who under unprecedented, difficult, and strange circumstances was able to put together a conference and bring it to pass. Thank you to the technical staff for making it possible to have a conference that included on-site and remote presenters interacting and to make it all stream successfully over the internet. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to our remote audience. We know you're out there even though we don't see you. I hope you've noticed the exploratory character of all of these presentations today. By its very nature, the tracing of ancient threads will always be a work in process, and there will always be more than that we can learn. The careful and judicious scholarship that we have seen here is evidence to me of one more thing, and that is that the Book of Mormon cannot be explained as the product of the imagination of Joseph Smith, but has to be explained as a revelation from God.